I first met James not actually here in California at all. It was in uh, Pittsburgh. And I was working as a fledgling filmmaker. I was just beginning to uh, make films. And I met James when he was about the same age that I am now, <laughs> as I remember. And at that point, Pittsburgh was like this amazing locus of um, activity, which is hard for one to believe now. And it was actually, I think, hard for Pittsburgh itself to believe, and certainly hard for James to believe why he was invited to you know, this very dark and dingy city. But um, into this environment came this succession of luminous figures, I would say, who represented the current California independent filmmaking scene. And, and the, the magnet really was Sally Dixon. And she brought uh, Bruce Bailey and Scott Bartlett and Gunver Nelson. And then one day, James Broughton appeared. And with him came this, this indescribable radiance, I would say. And he amazingly tried to work with actors and actresses in Pittsburgh in the same way that he had worked with them in San Francisco. And as a result, he met up with a lot of obstacles. And that was sort of my first, <laughs> my first um, memory of him. Uh, he was working in Sally Dixon's dining room in Pittsburgh in the middle of a snowstorm, in the middle of the winter in Pittsburgh. And he had tried with her help to find enough actors and actresses for his film Orogeny who would be willing to take off their clothes. And he wasn't used to this level of modesty. Uh, I mean, after all, he had shot the bed in uh, the Bay Area, 1968. This was 1973, 1974. And we'd gone through, you know, many years of uh, the so-called sexual revolution, and it was to him un unbelievable that there would be so much difficulty in working with, with un undressed actors and actresses. And so that was, in a sense, my first introduction to, to James, was his, um, his matter-of-fact way of dealing with the human body, which at that time, still, in most of the country, even in creative circles was a very radical and uh, unfamiliar way to be working with film. Well, I was more of an observer than a participant at that point. I was pretty much in awe of this process. Um, I had only made one film before. I felt that the way in which James engaged the cooperation of all of the members of his crew and the community in which he was working was nothing short of a miracle. And I think that was uh, a result of you know, this sort of philosophy of, of, of reaching, connecting, that he even speaks about on the uh, soundtrack of Orogeny. There's this uh, series of phrases about um, touching, reaching, connecting, which is a recurring theme, I think, in the way that he worked as an artist. It's a recurring theme in the way that he worked um, as a poet as well. And he, you know, this, this notion of, 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 a, of a sort of tactility that was evident in um, the way he directed Bob Gaylor as the um, cinematographer in that film. Here was a creative individual who understood that there really were no boundaries between life and art, and that he transcended those kinds of walls that often artists place between the, uh, the personal and the creative. And it seemed to me to be manifested primarily in the sense of touch. I felt that he had, you know, metaphorically, 
an, an, an amazing um, facility for touching people in terms of their emotions, but also touch was a very important part of his everyday. In such close collaboration with Joel Singer, I felt that unity of emotion and physicality became manifest in the work that they did together. He also said, you have to fall out of love with your footage. So if he has said that one has to fall in love with your cameraman, he also was able to distance himself and knew uh, the, the pitfalls of falling in love with the footage. This is called Seeing the Light. My favorite book of James is, I swear to abstain from all ready-made ideas and from all critical assumptions. I swear to refrain from falling in love with my own footage. I swear to be precise, ruthless, and articulate. I swear to delight the eye and the ear of all creatures. I swear to attempt the impossible, to exceed myself, and to venture where no one has ever pushed a button before. I think the, the adage to not fall in love with one's own footage has been the lesson that I honestly have tried most sincerely to follow that I learned from James. It's one of the most important aspects of filmmaking that I've been able to, uh, and most important lessons I've been able to impart to my own students because it is a major problem for most filmmakers. There's a difference between what we see in front of the camera, what is then recorded on the film or the video, and what then constitutes cinema art. And when one is in the position of doing the recording and the editing and making those decisions, it's very difficult to uh, separate oneself from the emotional connection that one has to have when we're looking through the viewfinder of a camera and the detachment to a certain extent that's necessary in making decisions about what actually works in the trajectory of a film. I feel like I was on the periphery of most of the work that was done in his last 25 years here in San Francisco, but I can't, um, I can't recall that I was actually physically involved. Um, I provided certain support systems and situations that made it possible for James and Joel to be together, which in that way, I think, uh, promoted their uh, collaboration. It's more along the lines of their sort of personal, um, uh, their first personal meetings. I was just finishing up my uh, master's program here when uh, James and Joel met in this very place. James was in the process of making a major transition in his life and moving out of his home of many years in San Rafael with Susanna. And uh, he had fallen in love with Joel and they needed a place to have privacy. And I had a small apartment on Potrero Hill, which they used for a number of years as their private place where they could be together. And it was this, you know, this, this really, this coming together um, that allowed this blossoming of this amazing collaboration. So it's, it's more along that, those kinds of uh, lines that I felt that I was uh, a part of that um, collaboration, more so than actually physically um, facilitating the films in any way. Um, I also uh, served as their best man <laughs> at, at their wedding. <laughs> That's the one of their many, one of their several weddings, <laughs> right? This was uh, at their wedding on Alan Watts's um, houseboat, 
in Sausalito. And I must admit, I don't remember the year, but it was a lavish affair. Uh, many luminaries in San Francisco were present. And uh, I was in awe of Alan Watts. The entire um, entourage was a spiritual experience <laughs> in many ways. Um, and that was, I think, one of the really important um, elements of James's essence was this joy that he took in celebration. So it was also, uh, it was one of many celebrations that I uh, attended. Most of them were birthdays because every single birthday was a source of enormous joy to him. He had this amazing uh, understanding that the best age was the age that you are. So at the age of 61, he fell in love with his muse, who was 25 years old. And every birthday after that was an amazing celebration. What's interesting about my relationship with Joel and James was that I took part in a lot of their domestic life. And James had a public life and he had a domestic life. And although he didn't create barriers between his life and his art, I was always surprised at how he uh, manifested a kind of um, mercurial quality sometimes in private and a kind of radiant ebullience in public. And so the, the, the rituals were more of a public event and I tended to be more part of their private lives together, partly because I knew, I knew James before I knew Joel, but I became closer friends with Joel before I became closer friends with James. So that the, the, my entry into their lives, to a certain extent, was through, ultimately through my close friendship with Joel. And so, whereas many people, I think, knew James in his public persona, my relationship, in a way, had a more pedestrian quality than the rituals. An example of that um, was this very sort of unexpected moment, this moment in a shopping mall in Ohio, <laughs> which was not a ritual in the mystical sense, <laughs> but it was a moment of returning to a uh, a point in both of our childhoods that seemed to simultaneously transport us to another place. Now, maybe that's a kind of ritual, <laughs> I'm not sure. But for us, it was uh, a transporting event, let me just say that. One day, we found ourselves at a shopping mall in Dayton, Ohio. And there was a photo booth, and we looked at each other, and our eyes sparked. We both had, you know, um, interest in the f photographic arts, and here was this sort of relic of our own childhoods. And we just stuffed ourselves in this booth, and we started acting like teenagers. And for better part of an hour, you know, we weren't in a shopping mall in Dayton, Ohio <laughs> anymore, but we were back in wherever we grew up, in this playful, um, transformative mode. Absolutely playmates, we were. This was, I'm guessing 1979, so we're talking um, 30 years ago. James taught at San Francisco State uh, 
for a few years, I believe, concurrently with his teaching here at the Art Institute. He much preferred teaching here because of, of the extraordinary uh, freedom of, uh, I mean, now we call it academic freedom, but in those days it was just creative freedom to teach whatever he pleased in whatever way he wanted. He taught a class for many years that was one of the most popular classes ever taught here, and he called it soul making. And it was in the filmmaking department, and yet one didn't have to shoot film. It brought together people who made lasting connections for the rest of their lives in that class. It was, a, it was, a, it was all about opening up those blocked channels of creative inspiration and served many generations of artists in film or other media for many years be, as a result of, of the intensity and uh, um, the liberation that he brought to the creative process in that class. So then the administration changed and soul making was no longer in fashion. <laughs> and uh, then I think it, that was a period where James began to think that uh, it was time to make another exit. He was a spellbinding teacher. He liked to share his joy about particular films with as many people as possible. So the kinds of classes that he enjoyed, I, th I observed, were the large lecture classes. So we have a lecture hall in the Art Institute here uh, that seats about 300 students. And when he taught the history of filmmaking classes here, those seats were overflowing. People came from all over North Beach who weren't even registered for the class to sit in on his class. And he was able to infuse his lectures with the, the personal experience of having lived through the years of the underground film explosion of the 60s and his participation in uh, these radical changes in the ways in which films were um, perceived and accepted by the public. And I think he felt uh, in that kind of context, he could reach the greatest number of people and he was able to affect the opinions and aesthetic predilections of uh, students who probably came to that class thinking they were going to be watching a series of Hollywood films. And so I think he really enjoyed um, opening their minds to a way of thinking about film and film history by presenting them with work that they never could have seen anywhere else. So my perception really was that he enjoyed that aspect of teaching, but that when it came down to sort of the nuts and bolts of the details of how to make a splice or you know how to set up a shot, he wasn't that interested. As long as he could teach what he wanted in the way that he wanted, he flourished in that kind of environment. But he, he detested <laughs> the bureaucracy, all of the attending uh, responsibilities of a conventional, professorial kind of condition, which is what he found at San Francisco State. So that to move from that situation to the Art Institute was more liberating. I can't deny that his radiance permeated that lecture hall when he was speaking about early silent films, uh, brackage films, works by Marie Mencken, Maya Deren, his great um, mentors, and he was able to pass that enthusiasm on to other students, and he was delighted by the work that was created by the students here. That brought great joy to his life because he had an unending delight in viewing film that he had never seen before. And that's, that's, that's really what he uh, 
tried to instill in his students was this sense that the, the reason one makes a film or any work of art is to create something that the world has never seen before. And he certainly lived up to that adage in his own work. That's one of the questions that I found really hard to answer, if I would even accept the word weird. I mean, I have trouble with the word weird. <laughs> uh, frankly, I never thought of James as being weird in any sense whatsoever. And so I'm not really sure what that question means. Well, I think that, you know, the, the notion of adventure, not predicament, really describes, in a sense, this principle on which he based his life, recognizing that a predicament is only such if you accept it as that, and that adventure, not predicament, is an attitude that gives rise to a kind of process that allows one to move beyond expectations, move beyond uh, accepted formulae, and that is the kind of attitude that exemplifies follow your weird. To a certain extent, I think he recognized that that individuality caused him to be less recognized and underappreciated, even though we know of him as being a very celebrated artist. I also work in a variety of media, but so did James work in you know, he, he considered himself a poet, but he was also known as a filmmaker. And he felt, I think, that the fact that he worked in more than one medium prevented him from being fully recognized in one or the other. Each of his films exemplified a totally different quality and approach to filmmaking. Following your own weird is also about not allowing the pressures of consistency, which are very strong in the art world, to govern the directions of one's creative output. He took great risks in his life and his art. He allowed himself this courageous inconsistency from one work to the next. Uh, Looney Tom doesn't look like the Gardener of Eden, you know. Um, and um, High Cuckoos doesn't look like any other film that James made. The stationary camera, this sort of, you know, Zen approach of allowing an event to unfold in its own time is very different from a film like Erogeny or a film um, like the potted psalm, in which every shot is very carefully orchestrated and directed. In Haikuku's, he steps back as, as the director and allows the natural rhythms of life to be the director in that film. And an event unfolds in its own time without his intervention. And so if one only knew that film of his, one could say he was a minimalist <laughs> or a structural filmmaker. That belief and creative stance prevented historians from encapsulating his work in a way that could place him in a particular place in film history. The films that are written about, that are shown in film history classes, you know, that are preserved in our film preservation archives are those that writers about film can neatly place into a particular niche in a continuum, as if there were a predictable or linear trajectory of progress in film or art history. And it's very difficult to place James in that kind of context. One of the things that I learned from James was the importance of having an open receptive attitude with regard to looking at all works of art. And as a teacher, it was a crucial 
element and in my own development of my own aesthetic. Because he was available as a model, it in a sense gave me permission to break out of the pressures of consistent stylistic production, which is a great pressure. One really uh, is almost required to have an identifying moniker in one's work in order to achieve a particular niche in the history of any, any, any art medium. James loved old silent comedy. So Max Sennett was a great favorite of James's. And of course that's reflected very much in his collaboration with Kermit Sheets and Looney Tom. He paid homage to Maya Darren and her amazing uh, ability to use a very conventionally shot image, but to construct the film in such a way that it came out of the experience of a dream. So dreams, of course, were very important to James. I know that James knew Maya Darren uh, and was influenced to a certain extent by her. Of course, Brackage, interestingly enough, as far distant as Brackage's, Sam Brackage's work was to James's, it was, a, again, a testament to the variety and the the range of his appreciation of films. Sidney Peterson, very much like James, even though their styles were different. He had as exquisite a sense of humor and as sharp an intellect, but their film aesthetics were diametrically opposed. James loved Sidney, Pete he called him, but disagreed entirely with the, the the style of Pete's shooting, Pete would, he would pick up a piece of broken glass, like a Coke bottle or some unconventional optical device and hold it in front of the lens of a camera and shoot through it. The two were here in San Francisco, James and Pete, and they of course collaborated, but they, had such very different styles of shooting that it was amazing that the two of them could communicate. And James always adhered to the well-shot image, whereas Pete worked with every sort of visual lens distortion imaginable. <laughs> mm. Well, it has a little bit of each one in it, and it's, so it has, uh, these elements of um, four in the morning, a little bit like golden positions, and yet also this quirkiness of visual image where abstraction enters into the film in ways that never did before for, for James. So it was quite a wonderful collaboration, uh, even though they did have their disagreements I think, ultimately, on um, some of the aesthetic decisions of that film. I think this is from Making Light of It. He said in that book, one must always do the impossible. Art itself is impossible. Trust the passion, the way of seeing, the zest of creating, what unimagined radiance will yet emerge from the flickering dark. So one of my most favorite quotes that, that I feel ultimately, as I think back, really influenced my life was this excerpt from one of his poems in which he says, in the long run, both everything and nothing matters a lot. So there's a passage again from his book, Seeing the Light. Practically speaking, cinema is putting images together in various musical 
measures. Editing is the music of cinema, as music is the architecture of time. Editing gives film its form, notation, counterpoint, development, pace, syncopation, and style. And this is one of my favorite parts. Such an alchemy should be spared the censorious term of editing. The art is that of composing. To edit film is to compose eye music. And the reason why that passage is important to me, or how it's influenced me, actually, is that uh, in the mid-1970s, when I was still a student here, uh, James was instrumental in helping me to establish a, uh, what we now would call a micro-cinema, which was a, a, a small, sort of itinerant uh, film exhibition venue for uh, underappreciated, underground experimental cinema, and we called it I Music. That was, uh, this book was just being written at that particular moment in time. Poets like James and like William Carlos Williams were able to evoke visual equivalence to the language. It's not that the words are an illustration, it's that the words are equivalent. And that's a different concept from using language to describe. It's, more, uh, it's a more palpable, active way of using language. It's, it's akin to, I think, the way that Gertrude Stein used language, that we had to hear. We had to really hear the musicality of her words spoken to gain an understanding of how language can have a physical presence. And so for me, much of what I appreciated in James's writing came out of this sense of the palpability of language. You know, James was first a poet, and he always called himself a poet. But he had such a deep understanding, appreciation of, and really, uh, uh, held images in awe. I think one of the great attractions between James and Joel was the, the visual wizardry, this magic that Joel was able to create in his films. His film, The Bed, made in 1968, that film formed a kind of benchmark for the experimental film scene in the 1960s in San Francisco. A few years before that, Canyon Cinema had been established. Uh, Chick Strand and uh, Bruce Bailey had uh, come together to create an environment in this small rural location in uh, Canyon, California, east of San Francisco, and as Legend had it, they hung up a bed sheet in their backyard and dragged out a projector and just started showing film. And film was cheap then. Um, it was easy to make work. It was easy to live cheaply in San Francisco, hard to believe <laughs> these days. And um, it certainly was a locus for creative people from all over the world. Once there was a place to show work, then the work was made. And with James in particular, he always needed a deadline. He needed to know that there was an audience. Audience was his nutrition, <laughs> really. He needed to know that there was an audience, that there would be a place or an opportunity to show work in order to generate work. So here was this most important ingredient. There was a place to show work. There was an unending number of young people who were coming through San Francisco during this period who were hungry for 
alternative anything. And so here we have <laughs> this, this wonderful atmosphere of the, the sexual revolution and James's work um, demonstrating that there was a very matter-of-fact way to present the human body that was not um, subject to censorship of any kind. Now Canyon was um, expanding into an organization that not only was showing work, but was also distributing. So here suddenly was this confluence of audience, exhibition space, and uh, hunger for alternatives that created the most perfect confluence of, of opportunity for experimental film. He had stopped making films for many years. The bed was this uh, sort of his return to experimental filmmaking after something of a fairly long absence. And so he became um, an inspiration to those filmmakers, those artists, uh, who had never seen work that was as um, um, expressive, that broke boundaries, that was not part of a specific kind of linear narrative. I mean, most um, people who were going to see quote-unquote art films in those days considered art film to be, you know, the French New Wave or European um, uh, work of that era. But that, those, they had storylines. They had specific kind of linear narratives. So to see work that that um, defied those kinds of um, conventions and did it in a way that also expressed this, this um, fluidity and the use of the human body in ways that um, they had never seen in a public kind of arena before. It gave rise to every kind of film expression that later sort of became codified in what you know, historians talk about as the experimental film revolution in San Francisco at that time. I think he was at the center of the group of filmmakers to whom the newer generation looked for the kind of um, freedom from these conventions that they were saddled with in terms of conventional narrative cinema. Well, uh, in the 60s, San Francisco had a flourishing industry of porno films. One of the influences in the Bay Area that allowed for a proliferation of services for filmmakers, a magnet for filmmakers, because without film services, it was difficult to make films, meaning film laboratories and all of these post-production facilities. It wasn't the independent filmmaker who supported the commercial laboratories, it was the porno industry. And so because of the uh, permissiveness of San Francisco in general, and because the era of the 60s was creating a, um, an atmosphere where um, it was possible to be working in non-conventional forms of any sort, San Francisco became home to this huge porno film industry. And that was a way of working with nudity, obviously, but it wasn't the way that James worked with nudity. And so there was this interesting sort of internal contradiction that I found with James's attitude toward nudity in his films, which allowed for at once obvious sensuality, but at the same time a kind of matter-of-fact way of uh, using the human body. Hermes Bird, where you have this amazing, I think it's a 10-minute film in slow motion of this male erection that is occurring, being shot by, of all things, a camera that was used to shoot the um, 
atom bomb tests in the Bikini Atolls in the 1950s, which was this high-speed camera that we had here at the Art Institute at the time. The, the way that he used nudity, it moved between these extremes. The bed used the nude human body, but erogeny takes it to touches and the sensation, the physical sensation. I think James said something once about the fact that the most important or special aspect of the human body was the ability to sense touch. Outside of his life as a filmmaker, you know, I think one of, <laughs> one of his honors that he enjoyed the most was being the Grand Marshal of the Gay Pride Parade in San Francisco. And I don't remember what year that was, but I remember how much he loved that recognition, I think equally as much as receiving a doctorate, which he did at the Art Institute here. I believe he won the Maya Darren Life Achievement Award. I know he received two Guggenheim grants, which is one of, I mean, it's almost unheard of now. No one can get more than one if you can even get one. Oh yes, he did get NEA grants, yeah. I think the, the, the irony was that there was never enough, you know, that there was never, uh, he did win most all of the major awards that one could win, win as a filmmaker, and yet there was still this sense as I'm sure others have told you, that there was an uh, under-recognition of his achievements. And so, again, I think because of the inconsistency of his production, found himself to be not as frequently written into film history as some of his contemporaries. Yeah. I believe it was Alan Watts who actually called him the uncrowned poet laureate of San Francisco. The fact that James had such a strong following in San Francisco brought Alan Watts to the point of feeling the need to say that someone needed to, to actually crown him <laughs> officially. <laughs> and uh, Alan Watts took it upon himself to do that with, uh, with I believe, with the support of um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I think they worked together on that one. <laughs> I think every underground filmmaker has experienced that. These days, audiences are very tolerant with regard to subject matter and style and content. But one of the things that characterized the 60s and the 70s was that audiences felt that they had the license to talk back to the films. And I recall screenings where people threw things at the screen if they didn't like the film that was being shown. And I don't remember if that happened at any of James's films particularly, but I'm speaking more about the general atmosphere. So if James said that people walked out of his films or that they were not well received, he was not alone during that period. It all depends on the expectation of the audience. Underground film had a certain cachet in the 60s, and many people came to view underground films for the uh, uh, sort of quality of aberration that they uh, characterized, and they were looking for something controversial, and they were not necessarily coming to view art, but they were interested in the controversy that surrounded these um, subterranean locations where films were often shown, hence the word underground. And if they weren't, um, if the films were not controversial enough, oftentimes they would be angry. If they were too controversial, if, the, if people came expecting them to be politically controversial and they were sexually explicit, then that angered that aspect of the audience. So, but the audiences were not 
docile. And that's one thing that's very, that's very different about audiences today. People have seen so much, you know, YouTube is ubiquitous. Um, there is not the same kind of outrage that was character, characteristic of many viewing experiences in the 60s. So I'm not surprised that James would say that some of his films did not meet with approval. There were people who did not like his films at all, and then there were, there was, there were other aspects of audiences who adored every word and every image that he created. And usually those people who did not like his films didn't come back a second time. And so the audiences tended to be filled with adoring viewers. And he created situations by his presence at the screenings. That's, that's one of the aspects of his um, film shows that was a very crucial component in his building of audience and his need to connect with the audience. He wasn't the type of filmmaker who would send the film off to be screened somewhere and then not show up. The power of his work is so inextricably connected to his personal physical presence that he manifested an extraordinary radiance as a human being in the presence of his work and in the presence of an audience experiencing his work. And that connection was so important to him that when one looks at his films in isolation, that part of the experience is missing. So my recollection of the important screenings that he's had always involve his presence. He introduced the films, he answered questions, but he didn't like the question and answer part very much. He preferred to introduce the work and then let, let the work unfold and then he loved having a party afterwards or some kind of celebration afterwards. As permissive and as open and as accepting the creative community was toward underground film in the 60s and 70s, audiences expressed their opinions very volatilely and without reservation. And so it was not uncommon for audiences uh, to walk out, to throw things. If, if there was a silent passage in a film, people would yell obscenities. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's quite a different atmosphere now. It's a loss to a certain extent. There's a certain vitality of you know, participation that isn't present now, but also on the positive side, a much greater respect for the variety and um, uh, individuality that's possible within film expression these days. It's in fact a, a choreographed work. It's a work of dance as much it is, as it is a work of film. And so even though there were non-dancers who performed in the film, as well as important dancers like Anna Halpern, the work itself unfolded like a dance piece as much as it is structured as a film, that the figures themselves became um, dancers. Even though the film ostensibly is sort of a a kind of a chronicle or like a, a cataloging of all of the kinds of activities that human beings perform in a bed. But there were many people who were known to Bay Area audiences who, who appeared in the film and so that it had a natural following. Well, I think all the people who participated in the bed also were uh, Bay Area people, but there were many famous people. And there's a shot in that film, in the bed, that is very reminiscent of a shot from Maya Darren's film choreography for camera, which is a slow motion sort of shot of a figure jumping over the bed, done in such a way as to, in a sense, pay homage to that particular film by Maya Darren. And James did that quite a bit in his films. He had 
erogeny was an, was an homage to um, Marie Mencken and Willard Moss, who had made Geography of the Body. The bridge, I'm not sure what the bridge is functioning anymore, but the bridge was one of these last bastions of um, independent film theaters that purported to show work that was not necessarily commercially viable. There were a number of those theaters in San Francisco where the owners um, were committed to showing work of great aesthetic value. I'm sure they personally supported the operations in a financial way because it wasn't financially um, uh, prudent, but uh, there was a commitment to uh, showing work of a creative nature that was not mainstream, that was not um, distributed widely. I think young artists or young filmmakers can gain a great deal of courage from becoming familiar with the body of work of a filmmaker like James Broughton. Not only for the specifics of the subject matter that he worked with or the, the, the uh, transcendent of the experience of watching his films, all of which are important, but the model that he presents for self-expression that knows no bounds. And so beyond the specifics of the individual works that he made, his essence describes the ideal creative process. And so a, a full understanding of his work and an understanding that's, uh, that's informed by, his, by a knowledge of his life and life decisions form a model for young filmmakers. I think James Broughton deserves to be remembered literally as a luminary figure. His work transcended the specificity of one medium and brought together communities of people who might have looked only at his films or only read his poems. And this, the act of, of co-joining these two uh, artistic forms was a very rare and unique contribution to artistic activity. There's something that's called the poetry film that normally is described or experienced as something which is a very literary form. James, in a sense, invented and perfected the poetic cinema, which is a very different thing from the poetry film. And by doing so, he broke down these boundaries between the use of language and the use of moving images and, and merged them into a new aesthetic. And in addition to the great joy that his films bring to people and the sense of humor, the sense of wit, the erudite sense of uh, great intelligence that he brings to bear on his work, in a larger sense, his contribution for posterity might be thought of as creating, promoting, and establishing a form that we could call poetic cinema. I'll remember most vividly James's way of reaching, connecting, and touching other individuals. I always remember that when we were together, he would reach for my hand, and he would hold my hand, and his, his hands, his fingers were so smooth. And I met him when he was over 60 years of age. 
But there was this sense of, um, of touch that was both metaphorical and physical. And I'll always remember the sensation of holding James' hand. Here's something that Lawrence Ferlinghetti said that I recall from the day that some of James' ashes were scattered at Stinson Beach. And he said of James, James was a lighthouse on a very dark coast, illuminating our landscape for many years to come. <laughs> 